I am Marcus James Dixon with Gold Derby, and we are joined today by Greg Whiteley, who's nominated for two Emmys this year for producing and directing Cheer on Netflix. Um, Greg, tell me about Nominations Morning. And besides your two noms, the show also got in for picture editing. Yeah, um, we were shooting on another project when I got a text from Julie Frazier, uh, who works uh, out of the Netflix uh, public relations office. And I don't know, if, you, if I'm being honest with you, Marcus, I think I try to pretend as a documentarian, as an artist, to be above such... Um, things as awards, but I'm really not. I was super excited and flattered and and I'm really looking forward to the ceremony and uh, it's been fun to plan with my wife what uh, what we'll do that night. And so, yeah, we were thrilled. Because uh, last time the show was up, it was 2020 and it was the same three Emmys, um, Unstructured Reality Program, Directing and Editing, and you guys won all of those, but it was a virtual COVID ceremony. So you couldn't dress up and, and go out to the ceremony was that kind of like a half glass full glass half full kind of moment well not for me i i it was so fun um to be a part of even that virtual festivity we i i remember where we were we were um sitting in our basement where we have a, a bigger tv and uh and uh we had a couple of friends over uh, and um, I just remember the whole thing being really cool and fun. I, I'm really looking forward to this, to being there in person, but no, I, I have really fond memories of it, Marcus. Um, and in between the first and second seasons, there was the scandal regarding one of the students, Jerry, and the show decides to address it head on. I mean, within the first five minutes, cheer coach Monica Aldama is, is mentioning it in the season premiere. Uh, was that a difficult decision to make about where to mention it, how to mention it? Not for me. Um, I feel like as we were trying to document the story of particularly the Navarro cheer team, um, it was just impossible to tell that story without accounting for Jerry and, and what had happened uh, in terms of his arrest and the news that broke because of it and the effect that it had on the team. It was so palpable. I mean, even though physically he was not present on that team during uh, you know, the, the latter half of us shooting that second season of Cheer, uh, it was as though he was ever present because it, there was just a, uh, uh, he cast a very long shadow over that whole season and particularly over Monica. Um, and uh, I think to tell their story, you, you just couldn't do it without telling his story. It was just so significant as an event. Personally speaking, um, I, I was devastating for me. And so it just maybe, maybe that was coloring the way I was seeing things, but I don't think so. I think any objective observer doing their job as a documentarian trying to chronicle their story would have come to the same conclusion that we came to. You just had to you had to lead with it. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of the elephant in the room in, in a way. Um, at the beginning- Yeah, that's of a great point. Like if, if, I think there was some discussion as we were editing, you know, when do we bring this up? Because the truth is we filmed for almost an entire season, almost before it was interrupted by COVID where Jerry was still a member of the team and, and his crimes had not come to light. Uh, but you're right. It, Marcus, it just would have felt like for the audience members that did know, they would have been wondering, oh, well, well when are you going to address this? When are you going to address this? And I think for the audience members that maybe didn't know and that were tuning in to follow this story, I think they would have wondered, well, why is this team feel different? Because they did feel different as a result of what had happened. Mm. Um, also, at the beginning of the season, you delve into the phenomenon of cheer. You you show the news stories and and the SNL sketch and Oprah and and Ellen's uh, twenty thousand dollar check. It's so rare that a docu series becomes this big. I mean, I can't think of another one. I know Mur making a murder was big, but it wasn't like a phenomenon like like cheer is. Yeah, I um, I have no explanation for it. Um, I think 
you know, I've been doing this a little while and we're, and I think we've been doing good work for a little while, the, the, me and the, the talented team that I, I work with. And so we always sort of expect success. We're always, hey, this is good. I think audiences are really going to like uh, this particular season of Last Chance You or whatever. Um, but the thing that happened with Cheer was uh, something that was very unique and, and even now very difficult to explain. And uh, for your directing category at the Emmys, you do have to like submit an episode for the judges to watch. And, and the one that submitted is, is the finale, Daytona part two. Um, what is it about that episode that you thought would be a really good one to kind of spotlight um, for, the, for that directing category? I, I don't know. I, 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 it's, it's tricky. I understand that people that are voting on this don't have time to watch eight or nine episodes of a show and, and of all the, I'm imagining dozens and dozens or hundreds of shows that are submitted for an Emmy in this category. I don't, you could, for us, it felt like picking one out of a hat. There, mm -hmm. there are any number of episodes that we're, we're very proud of. Um, and um, I think you, I think picking the eighth one, I, 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 I don't know. It was, it is where all of the stories resolve themselves. It's where everybody that had had a moment on that particular team, it all culminates. And, and it's also where both teams are shown uh, relatively equally during that episode. You have both TVCC and Navarro, uh, and there's some episodes in which we are bouncing to one team and then in the next episode going to another. And so it kind of made sense for the theme of that show to have both of them there. And the ending was something that, was in we just couldn't have scripted it uh and and so i think it kind of made sense but at the same time i'm super insecure about it marcus because i think if somebody if there's an emmy voter who has not seen episodes one through whatever seven and and they get to this i'm worried now they're going to be confused or they're not going to appreciate these little cutaways of say ladarius in the audience or morgan in the audience or the absence of jerry or uh, these small little moments that are happening between a new cheerleader like Maddie and, and Monica or Jada and Vante. Uh, whereas I think if you invested in all those episodes and you get to that last episode, you're going to feel a bit of a gut punch mm. or your heart soaring, depending on, on, on how you feel about these characters that we meticulously spend seven episodes developing those stories so that it pays off in that eighth episode. But I don't know. How else would you do it? Um, the the you mentioned that the, there's like a David and Goliath style narrative structure this season, the Trinity Valley and, and Navarro, and it did kind of pay off in the finale because you know when Navarro lost by just a fraction of a second, I I normally would have been as a viewer, you know, completely you know disheartened, but because I knew the other team, I'm like I'm like oh well I'm I'm also happy at the same time. Um, what was what was the moment like when you found out the results and Navarro had, had just barely lost? It was like the air was let out of the room almost. I feel like somebody planted this question for you. I love, I'm so grateful you asked this. So I think in traditional storytelling, it's natural, or at least there is a temptation to have a protagonist and an antagonist, and the protagonist is going to wear a white hat, and you 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 get the whole audience to empathize with that protagonist and and you do it at the expense of the antagonist oftentimes where you try and maybe you draw them in broader strokes you have less empathy for them and we thought here are two teams led by two coaches who we loved and we thought wouldn't it be interesting to have the audience heading into the the last two episodes where Daytona was was there was so much that happened at that weekend of Daytona that we stretched it over two episodes. Mm. Wouldn't it be interesting if the audience's loyalties were split? Because we felt that way. I felt that way. We Because of COVID in particular, we had to sequester two different crews. I was allowed to go between the two, but the, for mm. the, the rest of the crews, they had to stay in separate hotels. They were, they were um, uh, staying exclusively with the schools that they were assigned to. And so I had this unique experience, Marcus, where uh, they were announcing, and because of COVID at Daytona, they didn't announce it on the band shell, the main stage with both teams side by side with each other. 
that had met in the finals. Instead, one team was in their hotel room, in their their coach's hotel room, all, all 30 of them packed in a hotel room. And then there was a ballroom where the other team was going to be viewing the results on a, on a large screen as it streamed. And so they would, they were going to be streaming. It was a virtual award show. Uh, and so I was embedded with Navarro uh, for the first part. And we knew that whoever won was going to go race into the water. And we had a crew that had been stationed there. They'd been waiting there for a couple of hours in the water <laughs> for this, this, this whoever team was winning was going to go to their celebration that they do traditionally in in off off the waters of Daytona Beach. So we get there. I'm I'm there with Navarro, and it's a coin flip at this point because of how it had shook out, uh, and it was incredibly exciting because the first day in the prelims, Navarro was dominant. They were nearly nearly perfect, and and Trinity Valley was not. They had one of you know a, a poor routine and had been struggling in their rehearsals prior to that. Uh, and so we really felt like, oh my gosh, well, they've got no chance. Well, heading into the finals, Trinity Valley pulled out a performance for the ages. It was something not just flawless in their execution, but there was something special. They, they found another gear. And Navarro was still great, but a little hesitant. And so because the the last performance the second day is weighted marcus we we were trying to do the math and calculate how judges might see this and it was in my, our minds it was a coin flip who who would win mm -hmm. um so i was with navarro and they get the news that, that you know how they do it they said and in second place and they're all holding hands heads down navarro and you could feel it's the sadness and disappointment in that room was deafening. I don't think in my professional career of, of filming presidential candidates who uh, had lost on election night and being in that room and filming that, uh, being with um, people who uh, they'd lost close friends, getting that news. And, and you know, I've been, this was, this was right up there. I felt like I was in a, a wake immediately. It went from expectation, excitement, anticipation to absolute devastation. And I I was crying. I, I couldn't help, but, but I was embarrassed at my emotions. I then had to very quickly on my walkie, I was being told, okay, Trinity Valley is making the way to the beach. We had another crew with them. And I ran to that spot at the beach. As I'm running, I can see Trinity Valley walking all along the beach. And I'm quickly wiping away my tears <laughs> and then I see them and I can see a joy that I think is rare in, in human activity. I think it only comes through athletes that, that risk their lives like cheerleaders do and give themselves wholeheartedly to an activity like cheerleaders do and then have it pay off in such a dramatic way. To feel their joy was just emanating off of them on the beach. I began to cry again and and I was crying out of joy. And it, to have that experience emotionally where I was, to feel those two extremes, I remember thinking for this last episode, I wanna see if we can get audiences to feel that same thing, to feel Navarro's pain and disappointment as well as Trinity Valley's sheer joy and excitement. I, I think in, in terms of this types of storytelling, I didn't know, I'd never seen it done before and and I think maybe that's why we chose that episode to submit is mm -hmm. just to, to have that schizophrenia um was unique and 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 such a privilege to film and for me to personally have that experience it then became in, in our editorial process all right how do we tell this story in such a way that everybody can at least in, in some way or another feel the way that I did between that that um ballroom and the and that beach it was such great television and, and another scene in that finale I wanted to mention was the Monica and, and Ladarius kind of reunion where um, you, I mean you realize these are not characters on a TV show these are actually real people and it was a very sensitive scene and I love, I love how it was just handled production wise can you talk about that at all I really appreciate that because there is something so naked and vulnerable 
about that scene that it it felt at several moments when when I'm there in that hotel room and we've got a camera person and an audio person, we're looking at each other like, should we should we even be here? This feels like sacred. These are mm-hmm. two people who love each other and had a very difficult year, year and a half. And them coming together to try and figure out their relationship, it was it felt simultaneously as a privilege to film, but also, I wanted to be careful that we weren't exploiting this moment for, you know, our documentary and our storytelling purposes. We, and so there was a decision that was made as we were editing. There's a moment where Monica turns and references the camera because the Mm. emotion in that room, we, we had told that a meeting could happen. And so we were there prepared to film it if it did, but as it quickly became emotional, I, I caught eyes with Monica and and she said, hey, she turned to Ladarius, are you okay if, if this is filmed? And when Ladarius nodded and then they, she sort of acknowledged to me, who was, and I was behind the camera that you're okay to film this. We decided to keep that. It, we thought it was important for the audience to know that A, remind them that, that there's, a, there's a film crew here and that uh, that felt like we needed to own up to that. We needed the audience to be aware of that. It felt more honest that way, less exploitive. Uh, I don't know. I can't even explain why I feel that way. But the other thing that happened was I think it. I think Monica and Ladarius in that moment when they give permission, they're not just giving permission for our cameras to be there. They are giving permission for all of us as an mm-hmm. audience yeah. to watch it without feeling like voyeurs. And um, that scene to me stands out in, in my career. I've never filmed anything quite like it. Um, well, final question, Greg, is there going to be a chair season three? And if so, what might we expect? I just can't talk in any specifics about it. Um, I, I yeah. just think generally we're, we're um, I think these are things we're still working through. Netflix is very secretive. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Um, best of luck at the Emmys. I hope you get to give a, a real speech on, on the big stage this year. Oh, well, that means if I do, we won or I somehow pulled the Kanye West. Uh, but um, Marcus, I appreciate those well wishes. And this has been a thrill. Thanks for thanks for interviewing us. 